This is Join Us in France, episode 191. Bonjour, I'm Annie, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France, its many quirks, its history, its language, and of course, destinations in France you want to learn about because hopefully you'll be visiting soon. On today's episode, Elise and I talk about the lovely city of Pau, that's spelled P-A-U, where you can see the famous chateau of Henry IV, a most interesting and unusual French king. Pau is in the southwest of France, not too far from Bordeaux, in the Nouvelle-Aquitaine region. You should listen to this episode because even if you don't have immediate plans to visit Pau, Henry IV is an amazing French king and you'll learn lots of things about French chateaux that apply to any chateau in France. I'm always happy to see that people listen to episodes that don't have to do with Paris because the only way you're going to get to know France is to look at many parts of France. Join Us in France is brought to you by Patreon supporters and Addicted to France, the small group tour company for people who want to enjoy France to the fullest with zero stress. Check out our upcoming tours in May 2018 on addictedtofrance.com. Hello, Elise. Welcome back. Thank you, Annie. How are you? I'm good. We yeah. have some sun. That we makes have us sun. feel better. Yes, we're happy. We're sorry to hear about all the. We're, we're recording this uh, late January 2018, and we keep hearing about uh, people in America getting really cold weather. Yeah, and floods. And yes, there uh, are floods actually in a lot of places, unfortunately. Yeah, and yeah. people in Australia getting really, really hot weather. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Here we're just right. <laughs> More or less, yeah. In the southwest of France, we're fine. We're fine. And we're staying in the southwest of France today, talking about Henry the Fourth, yes, and his castle in Pau. In Pau. Pau. P A U. Yes. Short so, little town name. A little, yeah. Uh, Henry the Fourth was uh, one of France's kings. Mm -hmm. He was, in fact, the father of the dynasty that produced all the Louise, 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 and Louise. Is that, that right? That came after, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was born in the town of Po, which was, for centuries, the, the capital of a little kingdom that's actually in the Pyrenees, and the, it's the kingdom of Béarn. Oh, very good. Very nice little name, Béarn. Yeah, Béarn, yes, Béarn. I like it. And uh, when he was born, and I think for quite a long af time afterwards, uh, you know, the people in that area, they were part of the uh, people who spoke Occitan, not French. Uh, this mm -hmm. is another little world of part from the people up north you know, right, in Paris. Right, So he was uh, probably raised in Occitan. He was raised in Occitan. It was probably his first language. Although, uh, as, a, as a child, I'll, uh, just very briefly, just to mention that since he was of royal blood, he was actually sent by his uh, parents to Paris at the age of about five and spent a few years in the court because he was a cousin of the kings. I see. And so he most likely became bilingual. Right, right. But let's let's talk about Poe and the castle because it's a wonderful, fun place to visit. Mm -hmm. uh, 200 kilometers from Toulouse. Right. Just a, a good two-hour car drive. You can right. take the train if you wish. Yeah. It takes you to Poe. Um, Poe is a, a small city perched on top of a big hill and uh, it, it's uh, above uh, a river called the Gave of Po. And Gave, G-A-V-E, is actually a word in Old Occitan, which means a river of melted snow waters that runs very fast. Oh, wow. It means all that. All that. It means all that. <laughs> yes, it means all that. Uh, it's apparently uh, a word that's used only in the southwest of France. Uh, it's still used today. They don't call it a river. They call it a gave. Okay, yeah. Uh, I've which, heard that, actually, yeah. yes. And uh, the... the uh, castle that Henry le gave the, ou la gave? Uh, oh, you're asking me that okay. question. Sorry. Right, you ask a question like that. <laughs> Seriously, right. You know. Who cares? Who anyway. cares? Who cares? Anyway, yeah. Um, 
uh, the castle that Henry the Fourth was born in. He was born in uh, on the thirteenth of December, fifteen fifty two. Okay. Dead milieu, uh, smack in the <laughs> middle of the 16th century. Yeah. Uh, at uh, a time when France was uh, living through lots of turmoil, and we'll talk about that another time. Uh, that is the wars of religion. Right. His parents were both of royal blood. His mother, Jean uh, d'Albret, was Jean. Jean. J- Jeanne? Jean. 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 Yeah. Jeanne. Okay. Jeanne. Yeah. Jeanne. In, in English, it would be Jean. Right. right. Jeanne right. Moreau. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, she was a granddaughter of uh, Francois the First. So this okay. was uh, both on both sides of his family. It Francois was the First. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of, of royal blood. Yeah. Um, and he was born in uh, this castle that had originally been built uh, five hundred years earlier as a wooden fortification up, up on top of this hill to protect uh, from invasion uh, because people would follow this river and the the path that it created, it was kind of a natural path east and west, created basically uh, by the Romans ancient, ancient times before. And so uh, in order to worry, not to worry about the invasion by the English mm-hmm. or by the other counts and lords that were coming from the uh, east, Right, because uh, Lourdes isn't far away from and Lourdes is not far away. Yeah. Uh, in order to really have this kingdom, imagine uh, at, in the year about 1000, when there were invasions all the time coming from every direction, mm-hmm. uh, they built this, what originally was all wooden uh, fortified uh, castle. I see. And the, the, the pillars that they used to create it, because it's built with four towers on four corners, okay. and three of them were very, very sturdy with these enormous, enormous pillars made out of wood. And the word for those pillars in the local language is po. Oh. And that is how the... So po, like piloti or something. Exactly. Okay. And okay. that apparently was, that came first. The town was built around it and simply became known as po. So because they had this fortified Chat, wooden chateau, right. cas, cas, castle, castle, not a chateau. Right. A cha- <clears throat> yeah, so the distinction, uh, uh, when I say a chateau, it's a pretty thing, and a castle is As more... castle of, is more fortified. Yes, it's a fortified. It's fortified. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the castles basically became chateaus in the time of the 1500s in the Renaissance. Right. Because they no longer felt they needed to have all these walls the around them to, stuff to protect themselves. not so important. Right. Yeah, let's... Uh, for a second, we mentioned that Pau is close to Lourdes, and we did an episode on Lourdes. It was number 100. Okay. So if you are going to visit the area... You can do both It, it would really day. make sense. I mean... You know, we were discussing with Elise how do we categorize this episode because today uh, Po is in the Occitanie region, right? Right, which is a big region, very big. And then, but you, uh, this is more the south of the region, so you, uh, it's close to Lourdes. It's uh, then, so if you go uh, east to west in the south of France, you 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 have Lourdes and then you have Po. Right. And then if you keep going, you're you go not, into Basque country. You, you're not very far from Basque country. Right. And it would make sense as a visitor today to visit those together. Yes. Because they're so close. Because they're so close. Right. So the, the castle was originally a, a fortification. It, it had uh, several different Viscounts, the Viscounts of Bayern, who were actually the original royalty of the area. And for many, many, many years, for several centuries, it was a separate little kingdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, uh, what's interesting is that in the, the history of the southwest of France, more than in the southeast, is that there were lots of separate teeny little kingdoms that were basically attached to the Pyrenees Mountains. I see. And because they were relatively isolated probably, that's one of the reasons, they managed to stay independent for a very long time. I see. Uh, they were not annexed because they were not priority. Uh, I mean, basically, let's face it, you know, in terms of wars and annexation and things like that. Mm-hmm. So what you have is uh, some of the illustrious ancestors of Henry IV. Uh, the most famous is uh, uh, someone, the Count uh, Gaston Fabius. Oh, yes. Who was the... Uh, uh, Count of uh, Foix and Po at the same time. Okay, and that yeah, is, that's another city. That's, that's another not city. So that's far. much further east. Yeah, it's much further, and it's kind of hard to drive right. between Foix and Lourdes. But but what happened was uh, when he was the uh, Today, I mean. ruler, 
he he took this old wooden castle and turned it into what was the time we're talking 1300s mm-hmm. a modern stone castle mm-hmm. he added a tower that is uh 33 meters high which is very very high he added another wing to the castle he used brick and stone so a good part of the castle that exists today is actually from that time that is from the uh, end of the 14th century because obviously by that time you modernized you know and yeah. he, you added things that were not in existence uh, in the year 1000 mm-hmm. and obviously one of the dangers of a wooden castle is that it can burn yeah and they did <laughs> and I'm sure very often did, you know? yes. they did very very often so uh, what happens is that over the time the castle was added to uh, revised in terms of the materials and a good part of what we see today. Basically, half of it is from that time period between the 1400s and the 1500s, and the other part of what exists today is, in fact, restoration and rebuilding of the 19th century, which oh, is wow. something so, we've talked about in a lot of other places. Yeah, so it's been renovated. It's been renovated. It's been renovated. Was it Viollet le Duc that did it or no, somebody no, else? No, no, no. Okay, somebody no, else. No, somebody else. But but it, uh, he didn't, I doubt if he would have thought it important enough, to be honest. I'm not even <laughs> sure. You know, he had his own version of priorities, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the time we get to uh, the middle of the 1500s, yeah. It is the seat of a powerful little kingdom that, interestingly enough, is coveted by the French king, by the English king, and by the kingdoms in Spain on the other side of the mountains. But because uh, if, of its isolation, and you, when you drive there, you see it's really fairly isolated. There are things not too far away. Tarb is not too far away. Lourdes is not too far away. Yeah. But um, it, it was able to protect itself. So they were able, with the fortifications and two sets of walls around the castle, to make sure that nobody ever invaded them. And that is really what that's, what, what, that's what happened. They never were invaded. When they were finally taken over, it was through uh, marriage and uh, political right. negotiations. Alliance, alliances. Uh, uh, yeah. Alliances of that kind. So Henry IV was born in this uh, castle. His mom, uh, Jeanne d'Albret, and his father, Antoine de Bourbon, uh, they were both mm. of, of royal blood. Yeah. Uh, he was a cousin of the kings of France. Okay. And, and she was a granddaughter of François Premier. And she was said. a granddaughter of François right. Premier. So uh, he he was. Uh, there were other children uh, that came after, but he was definitely going to be the one who would become king of this small kingdom. Right. But so two things happened. One is that his mother was a Calvinist, a Protestant, at a mm. time in the middle of the 16th century when a good proportion of the people in France were going to this new, what they call in French, reformed religion. Yeah. And his father was Catholic ah. and, and a practicing Catholic. Okay. So there, since their marriage, I don't know if it was an arranged marriage, but obviously there was a point of real uh, dissension be- between the two parents. Yeah, yeah. His father took him and uh, placed him in the French court in Paris Specifically, so he would be under the influence of the French kings, and that was both for political reasons and for reasons of religion. But before okay. then, this is a wonderful anecdote. His grandfather, not his father, his grandfather, paternal grandfather, paternal grandfather, yeah, um, who uh, was uh, uh, someone who really believed that his his grandson should stay as a separate king of the separate kingdom. He didn't want this annexation uh, with, the, with the North, but he was a traditionalist of customs from the Pyrenees. And so at his birth, no, mm-hmm. at his birth, I'm. this could have been when he was two days old. This could have been when he was two weeks old. I really, really don't right. know. But his grandfather took him, brought him to his suite, and did what apparently became a tradition for centuries and you don't know this, but this is really going to make you laugh. He took his little baby grandson and he took a huge, uh, enormous um, uh, head of garlic, uh, cut it, cut it open, and rubbed his lips with the garlic. 
oh, look at her face. I love Why? it. He rubbed his face. And he had him, he poured into a goblet a lot of uh, wine of the area, which they think was Jurançon, which is actually a white wine. But it's who a good knows? wine. It's a good wine, yeah. I, I don't agree with the garlic, but the wine and is good. he had him breathe in the fumes of the wine. Now, they say this is at his birth, but I'm, I'm assuming that this could have been yeah, when he was a weird. week or two old. And this is a tradition. This is an ancient tradition that apparently continued on for a very long time because the, the belief was that by uh, having the garlic rubbed on his lips and having breathing in the, the, the vapors of the wine, he would have good health. Good health. Yes. Okay, well. Good health. At least he didn't make him drink the wine. No, <laughs> but apparently the, the story is, and since we know by many, 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 many documents that Henry IV was, among other things, a real ladies' man <laughs> and had two or three mistresses that were really important in his life, one of them wrote uh, and said that when she first met him, and this is, of course, later on when he's an adult and he's a powerful man, and then, of course, when he's king of France, yeah that uh, he made advances towards her and she couldn't stand it because he reeked of garlic. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously the tradition of garlic stayed with him first. Uh, the garlic king. The garlic king. The garlic king, the good garlic king, you know, yeah. in that order. So um, what happened was that <clears throat> the castle in Poe was be, uh, basically became a second residence for him because mm. he spent so much of his time going back and forth between Paris, where he was basically uh, invited to be part of the court since he was, of course, of royal birth, and Po, uh, because it was the, the center of this kingdom of, of Bayern. And then uh, at the age of 19, mm -hmm. he was... Uh, married off to, and we really have to put it in those terms because it was definitely something he did not want. It was arranged. And it was not even something that uh, his mother uh, particularly wanted, uh, but his mother was part of a very, very influential branch of the royal family, and a good number of these people had converted to Protestantism. And so in order to try and make an alliance that would keep the country from going into civil war, which unfortunately did not prevent this from happening. Yeah, did. Uh, he was married off to uh, a cousin of his. She was uh, uh, clearly a, uh, probably a second degree cousin or something like that. And that is Margaret de Valois, who was a sister of the king. Ah. Yeah, the king had uh, two brothers uh, and a sister. And uh, so he... And which king are you talking about here? We are talking about Henry II. Okay. Henry II. Uh, uh, his brother was designated as Henry III because the Henry II died very suddenly. Right. And then Henry III became king. And then when Henry III died, the, the next in line in order to in terms of the laws of what they call a Salic laws, which means the laws of royal blood, mm -hmm. uh, the next in line turned out to be Henry the, the fourth, fourth. From who, who in his own personal life had no ambition uh, at all at first to be king of France and found himself... Uh, right. He at, just wanted to be the king of Bayern. They just wanted to be the king of Bayern. And, yeah. uh, and uh, in fact, of Navarre, because his mother by alliance was also... Uh, Princess of Navarre, which is, of course, on the other side of the Pyrenees. But then there was, a, there was a whole political thing. But he basically would have been very happy with his soldiers, who were among the people who became some of the musketeers. Hmm. Uh, and he had the Duke of Armagnac as uh, one of his cousins. And uh, Duke of Armagnac is, of course, the man who was responsible for the musketeers, who really yeah. existed. Uh, he would have been very happy traveling around, uh, visiting Paris and being king where he was in the south and being a good, he was both a good warrior and uh, he was actually a very cultivated person, but of course he was from the south. Uh, so he had certain, as far as the people from the north in Paris, certain disadvantages. You know? so he probably had a wicked accent. He probably had a terribly <laughs> wicked accent. Indeed, indeed. You know? And uh, between the accent and the garlic, whoa, you know, yeah. we don't know. But what happens to the castle? The, the, the castle winds up being used by his uh, family, 
by cousins yeah. while he spends his years traveling around France and becoming and then eventually being the, the king. He right. becomes king in 1589. Okay. Uh, and so in 1589, he he's is like 30 something. He is, uh, right. He's 37, yep. 36, 37. Yep. <clears throat> and, uh, we know that, uh, he was king from 1589 until he's, uh, his assassination in Paris in 1610. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, uh, then it is of course his son who, uh, Louis the 13th, who becomes king. So what happens to this castle? This castle during this period of time is basically used by his soldiers. Uh, it's still uh, considered to be important from a defensive point of view, but not nearly as important before. And by distant relatives who, are, of course, are all members of the royal entourage. Mm -hmm. And it's his son, Louis XIII, who in the year 1620, so this is 10 years after Henry IV dies. Right, so, so Louis XIII is already the king? He's already a king. He was, made, he was, he was uh, a minor when his father is assassinated. Uh, his mother, Catherine de Medici, becomes regent. Right. Uh, the differences were enormous in mentality, personality, and every other way between Henry IV and his son, Louis XIII. Louis XIII becomes a very conservative, very orthodox Catholic, and wants to bring Catholicism back to a country that Henry IV had opened up so that there was freedom of religion from both Protestants and Catholics. Yeah, and this yeah. is, we'll do this as another episode. We'll talk about the wars of, of religion. Of religion. Yeah. But what happens, interestingly yeah. enough, is that Louis XIII, who is the one responsible for the beginning of the Versailles becoming a chateau, he goes, he goes down to Bayern, to Po, and visits this castle, which is his by heritage, right, right, and decides to fix it up a little bit. Ah, and he, uh, because he was a, a king who traveled all the time, he decides to turn it into some place more comfortable, and so he uh, adds. He brings in uh, builders, and he brings in furniture and tapestry and all of these things mm. from the north. Yeah, and he has the castle redone, we can consider it to be redone. Mm -hmm. And so under the, his reign, which takes us into, of course, the middle of the 1600s, right. the castle becomes a much more up-to-date place and more comfortable place. More genteel. Me more genteel. <laughs> Less right. of a castle and more of a chateau, maybe? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. The fortifications are no longer really necessary, but they're, they're kept there for quite a while. And what happens is that he gives custody of the chateau to be taken care of by a noble family, the family called the Gramont family. Gramont. Gramont. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a local name. It's a local Lots name. Lots of things are called right. Gramont around here. Yeah. And uh, officially, they are the people who live there and take care of this castle. Okay. While uh, Louis the Thirteenth and then his descendants, Fourteenth, Fifteenth, and Sixteenth, yeah. um, move around and eventually settle into Versailles. And so uh, the castle in Po is not used very much. It's not very important. And of course, we come up to the French Revolution. And what happens is that the revolution, a lot of these castles were uh, destroyed. But interestingly enough, the castle of or Poe, abused anyway, or abused, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cathedrals too. W was taken over uh, as an outpost for the army because, uh, b with the revolution, they're worried about, of course, the soldiers and the king of Spain who are coming up from from the south, and yeah. and the English coming from the west, and everybody's trying to stop this revolution anyway. Mm -hmm. So the 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 castle is taken over uh, by the military. Mm -hmm. And once the revolution has calmed down, because in the Southwest it was important, but not nearly as important as in the North, mm -hmm. uh, the, and, and once the revolutionary spirit has disappeared, mm -hmm. and you have the restoration of the monarchy under Louis-Philippe. Yes. And Louis-Philippe is a cousin of Louis XVI. Yeah. And Louis-Philippe decides that he really likes this castle. In Po. In Po. <laughs> I don't know exactly why, but he decides that he really, really likes it. And so what does he do? Area. He has not only uh, were there pieces of furniture and tapestry uh, brought from, from the north, but he has pieces remade. 
uh, and he decides that the castle in Poe is a perfect example of a Southern Renaissance castle. Mm. And so one of the things, of course, that we've talked about a little bit, but is very interesting about the 19th century is that there's this spirit of replication, of replication of ancient Gothic, of ancient Renaissance, of ancient right. everything. So he uh, uh, takes the royal manufacturers for furniture and tapestry and has them reproduce in an identical way pieces of furniture and tapestry from the Renaissance. I see. And he has them brought to the castle in Poe. Oh, cool. So that's, is that what we see today? That is a lot of what we see today. I see. Now, there are two things that are theoretically, hypothetically, from the time of Henry IV. One is his cradle. His cradle <laughs> was a tortoise shell. Aww. And it's famous in history because it was his grandfather, again, this, this famous grandfather who had his lips rubbed with garlic as, as a newborn baby. <laughs> Crazy who grandfather. said, among other things, that in order to be strong and a warrior, he should have this to sleep in. I don't know what the reason is for. There has to be some kind of symbolic Total reason. Shell. But it is a huge, huge tortoise shell that became wow. his cradle. And that is what it, you can still see when you go to the castle in Poe and his room. Now, uh, the furniture, to my disappointment, I thought was the authentic original furniture. One of the things you see is the four-poster bed where he slept when he did visit the castle. Right. That is Henry IV we're still talking about. Yeah. And one of the things so you notice very, very quickly is that it's a very short bed. Uh, ah. Now, most people assume when you see beds like this, which are typical of beds that you would see in, in Renaissance chateau, and we can call it a castle, and then it became a chateau, are that the people were very small, but that is not why. It oh. is because people slept sitting up. What? With pillows behind their back on an incline because it was believed, and it was believed for centuries and centuries and centuries, that if you slept completely flat on your back, you would suffocate. <laughs> <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs> it's true. This is what they did. <laughs> so uh, they could have tested that theory, you know. They they could have. They, they probably brave, did. A brave yeah. soul could have tested that theory and realized, oh no, I slept okay. Yes, well, well, <laughs> I'm still alive. But 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 they didn't. And so in fact, it, that is truly the reason why. Oh wow. Uh, a lot of the, these beautiful beds are They're so short. Are so short. It's because they would have all of these wonderful pillows, and they would sleep on this incline. Well, the, I'm good with pillows, but like. The, the, down is good the other thing is, and this has to do not so much with the castle as with the furniture, is that even though uh, it was uh, refurbished with a lot of furniture that was uh, theoretically from the Renaissance and some pieces that were recuperated that are genuinely from the Renaissance, yeah. um, one of the other things is that, now you know the beds, the, the, the beds from that time were basically like a double bed today, uh, certainly... Yeah. At, at the largest, at the widest. That, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. But yeah. because uh, the building itself, because the building itself, even though there was all this beautiful tapestry and furniture from the Renaissance, the building itself was still a building that in its structure was largely feudal. So it, it was not a building that had a lot of heating, even though it had these <laughs> huge hearths and, you know, fireplaces. Yeah, yeah. People never slept alone. I see. And even the king... Uh, not necessarily with just his l latest mistress or wife, but sometimes an honored invited person would be invited to actually sleep clothed in the bed with a king. With a king. With a king. And uh, this, mm. was, this was so that they would stay warm. I guess that's, that makes sense. I mean, if there's more people in the bed, you don't get so cold, I guess. Yeah, although it's... But it's a tiny it's, bed. It's, uh, we, we wouldn't be comfortable to nowadays like that. We, no, no, and, and that's not I, don't know. Roll, I don't care what anybody like says. That. It sounds a little suspicious to me anyway. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm not really sure about this, you know. No. But uh, so, so Louis-Philippe, uh, uh, starting basically uh, in the 1830s, did what can be considered to be almost a complete 
restoration of furniture and of the uh, tapestries. And they are still there. When you visit it, what's one of the things that's nice about this, visiting this castle, you have this huge uh, courtyard when you enter in. You have a view that's spectacular over the Gav, the river down below, and on a clear day of the mountains mm -hmm. south, which of course is the high Pyrenees. Um, it's, it's really quite yeah, lovely. It's nice, because yeah. it's a, And then we have uh, Napoleon III, who came after Louis Philippe? Right. And what he did was he did structural renovation. Ah, okay. So one of them did uh, furniture and uh, interior decoration renovation, and the other one did some structural renovation. And he added a couple of uh, pieces and a tower uh, in the spirit of someone like Violet the Duke, uh, thinking that this was what it probably looked like in the Renaissance but he added his own little touch to it. And after uh, France finally, ultimately became a republic, mm -hmm. uh, the building was pretty much left uh, intact but empty with some caretakers. Mm. And it was in uh, the end of the 19th century that they started to talk about uh, making it into a historical monument. And it became a historical monument, but it became the castle known as... Henry the Fourth Castle and his museum in 1929. Okay, so it was his castle. It was really associated with him and his life and the story of all of that. But it was only in 1929 that it officially became known as the Henry the Fourth Castle Museum, and that's okay. what it is today. It's open every day of the year except for the first of May, which is our Labor Day here. Yeah, uh, Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Sure. Uh, and it's a lovely, fun place to visit because it's not just the structure of the building, but you you it see its position nice. and you see all these beautiful furnishings on the inside. Uh, it's kind of neat. And of course, at certain times of the year, like in the summer, like many of these other castles, particularly in the south, they have exhibits of things. Right. So special exhibits. There's a special exhibit. There's a little bookstore. They, they have all kinds of things. So it's a wonderful uh, place to visit and gives you a sense of... Uh, the history of these little, uh, what were really separate kingdoms until uh, really the 16th century. Right. So, uh, so yeah, France has a, some countries, you like Italy and Germany, you study the unification of the right. country. France, uh, it happened it's like, yeah, it's older and it's, mm, it happened like organically. It's right. kind of a, yeah, there wasn't fights. Well, there, I'm sure there, there were, were fights. There, there but, were, but more it was but, alliances. Yeah, yeah. And, and in yeah. fact, the, the one thing I should have mentioned that I forgot to mention is that it was Louis the Thirteenth, so Henry the Fourth's son, who officially annexed Bayern. So interestingly okay, enough, okay. it wasn't Henry the Fourth himself, even though he could. I mean, he it was his have, since kingdom. he was <laughs> he was king of France, and, and he was king of Bayern. <laughs> but for some reason officially it wasn't made part of the kingdom of France until his son, Louis the 13th um, declared that it was part yeah, of his possessions. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. it's, it's kind of interesting how all of that played out. Yeah. There's lots of things that on the surface don't make sense, but it made sense at the time. It made sense you at know. the time. And this, I mean, Poe is a, is a medium size. It's medium size. It, it's the biggest city in its, in the department. Right. Uh, it is, so it's, uh, it's, it's... Which department is that? La, 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 la. It's... Um, oh, um, oh, hang on. I'm gonna Pyrene, I think. Isn't it? I think it's Haute Pyrene. I'll look it up because... It's the administrative center. <coughs> non, Pyrene Atlantique. Uh, Pyrene, pardon. Okay, Pyrene so, Atlantique. So, to, to, to explain how... Uh, how it works today, right. we, at the beginning of the show, we said it's part of Occitanie, but right. as you know, we still have departments yes. in France, and Pau is the chef lieu du département. It's des, like the county seat. Right, the Pyrénées Atlantiques. Right. So and it's the biggest city. It's the biggest in, city in the area, f f as far as that department is concerned. Because it's a fairly rural area. Um, yeah. To, to the south, the, the the city is literally. Uh, it's rather spectacular. If you go by train, which I've done twice, the train station is down below along the riverbed. Mm -hmm. Not in the river, but right next to it. You know, <laughs> and you the castle is up above. All of the city is pretty much up. 
and you have to either walk it or there's this uh, uh, kind of uh, monorail thing that will take you up, or you can take a bus, obviously. And it's rather monorail, spect- huh? um, yeah. There's a kind of monorail, huh. uh, and you I haven't been in so long. It, it, it's rather spectacular. So if you're up above on a nice day, you have a view that's fabulous of the Pyrenees with snow on top. Of, even in the summertime, you can get to see some still. There's still some snow in the mm-hmm. high Pyrenees. Uh, it's rural in the area around mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. and it's. Got a small university. Uh, it, a lot of people yeah, go got... there for a couple of years and then finish off by coming to Toulouse or going to Bordeaux because yeah. it doesn't have a big university. I actually know several people who went to the... Um, so they have an engineering school. So have, when they have one of these um, prépa intégré yeah. engineering school, so that's a very French thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a prep it's school speech, plus engineering right. school. And so they take the kids from... You know, right after their baccalaureate for right. five years, and they come out with, uh, I think they come out with a master. Huh? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. To, to visitors, that doesn't matter. But and I know a few people who've sent their a, kids there. Yeah. yeah. And Poe, of course, it, uh, it's, a, it's very pretty. It's got a beautiful old city center. It's not very big, mm-hmm. uh, but it's very lovely. Uh, it has some nice restaurants. How long would you spend there? Well, I would. I like going there. I mean, when I've gone there, actually, uh, I like having lunch there. Don't ask me why. I like the food there. It's very much the Gascon food, you know, and they have lots of nice little restaurants. So and duck? Duck, but also they have um, uh, lots of things, of course, with duck. They also have uh, a couple of other dishes that are really local kinds of the, the dishes. And then that soup, the garbure, which is very typical of that area. If you're, uh, it's, it's kind of like an enormous stew thing with beans and the vegetables and meat of course it's garbure garbure, oui, oui. garbure. It's g-a-r-b-u-r-e garbure you know i've heard of that but i don't know if i've ever had it's it. delicious of course it's not something to have in the summertime you know okay. i mean if you okay, don't want uh... to eat that in the summer you would just sink into the gav you know without <laughs> any problem you know um, but it's a lovely little city to walk around i would say it's if you do a visit to the castle uh, the visit to the castle is probably an hour and a half at the most. And then right. a walk around town. If you just want to do a quick walk around, take a look in some of the old buildings and see. Maybe it's a two and a half hour stop. If you have okay. lunch, it's more. Uh, right. So you a, might. It's, it's, it's a, half a day, you know. So can you do it as a day trip from Toulouse? Absolutely. Yes. It's a, it it depends how much driving you want to do. If you, right. if you want to, you can do that. And if you are curious or interested in going to Lourdes, as you mentioned, you can do those as each one a half a day type thing. Right. Because they're it's a fair it's a two hour drive. It's a good steady two hours on the auto route drive. It will make for know. a long day though. If you leave it's a long in, day. if you leave Toulouse at eight in the morning, uh, two hours to drive to Lourdes or a little less maybe, and then what to see the Lourdes? What, you go to the grotto, hours. and then yeah, and then there's even actually a very interesting ethnological museum in Lourdes. But you can do them. To, I've done them together. separately, and I've done them together. Uh, I did it together, both Lourdes and Po, with a couple of clients. Uh, I've done it myself, going to Po, just visiting Po. Mm-hmm. But if you are interested in going to Po, it's also very nice. There are a couple of nice little stops in the countryside along there that you can do. And if the weather's nice, you can even picnic outside of right. Po if you want, because the river is very beautiful and mm-hmm. there are, there's forests and hills and, and, and things like that. So mm-hmm. you can actually combine going to the city, which is still a city, even if it's small, uh, there's a part of it that's now, of course, built up down below. So it's a fairly bustling, tiny little city, but it's right, right. twenty to 30,000. I'm not sure how many people are in there. Population. What is it? 30,000? 77,000. Oh. 77,000. Oh, I'm sorry, Poe. Excuse yes. me. Oh, yes. yes. That's because it's expanded, obviously. Yes. Um, but I, I, it's a nice uh, venture into the uh that area which is heading into the southwest Mm -hmm. uh i as you mentioned earlier if people are interested in going to basque country which is very beautiful and we can talk Mm -hmm. about some more uh it's a great thing to do as a two three day trip that you start by going to po and then keep going a little further west and to the basque country to to basque country and that's also a nice thing to do Mm -hmm. otherwise it's up to the you know, people, some people don't mind doing a long drive and not staying a long time in a place. I'm more of a leisurely, yeah, yeah, take yeah. it easy type. Yeah. Of, uh, I, I want to caution people. It looks on the map like Foix and 
uh, Lourdes and Pau are, are all close. aligned, that and they're close, but... They're not. If, when you're driving, they're not. Because if you are driving between Foix and Pau, you have to go across the Parc Naturel Régional des Pyrénées. And that's just very, very small roads. So it's going to be a two-lane road. You're going to go through every little village. There's going to be lots of twists and turns. Uh, hilly. It's not a drive I would recommend to foreigners who are not used to French roads. Whereas the road to Po is auto route. Right. Between Toulouse and Po, you have a freeway. Big freeway. Yeah. That's, uh, so you could do Toulouse, Tarbes, um, uh, Lourdes, Po. All of that is on the freeway. Right. And, and, but, and, and uh, uh, the drive from Po to Lourdes is very beautiful, but it's more of a sinuous drive on small departmentals. Right, let me take a look at that, because I haven't... Um, if you are going to, um, to do both Lourdes and Po, uh, Lourdes is a little bit off of the freeway, right, but, further you, south. but you get freeway the, almost all the way to right. Tarbes, and then you get off the freeway to right. get to Lourdes. And then you get back on the freeway and go to Pau. And go to Pau. So that's yeah. fairly simple drive. Right. Um, but from Foix, it's just not... No. I, I wouldn't recommend it. But <clears throat> I, it's a very nice area. It's very green. Uh, it's got a lot of nature around it. And the city of Po is a city I happen to like. Uh, it's interesting. I didn't realize it was now up to 70-something thousand people. Uh, but I like it. It's very pretty. It's uh, part of it that's built up right above where the train station is, was you can see is very much 19th century, rebuilt in the style of the promenades like in Nice and things like that, because mm -hmm. it has all of these terraces and wide promenades that look out south on the Pyrenees. So mm -hmm. it's very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it has an old medieval center. So I like it there. Yeah, it's a nice place to spend a day. And it's one of these towns, I know a lot of people... I know a lot of people um, uh, find the show because they're thinking about moving to France. It's one of these uh, cities uh, in France that's not super famous. And so you, I'm, I, I suspect it would be a, a nice... Um, a, for some people, it would be perfect because it's not too tiny. Right. Uh, it's not too big. It's not too expensive. You know, it's, it's one of these really nice little towns that we have in the southwest but it is not paris i mean don't expect to have like life is very slow in the southwest, in we, the like, southwest. we like to take our time i mean paris is more of a toulouse is more of a happening place in the southwest but a lot of these places you know there's not going to be lots and lots of tourists um, but but it's a you know po is a typical place where it has a little bit of everything and uh, in the summertime, has some music festivals, yeah. has things like that. This is, of course, the, the wonderful thing about visiting starting in June, going into the end of September, is right. that you have theater and music festivals pretty much everywhere. And, of course, uh, you what you have there is the... I'm not sure how high up it is, but it's nice. The air is nice. It's not... Yeah. There's no industry very, very, very close to the city. It's, yeah. there's, there are other things that are not that far, but right there, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely place. We recommend it. And if you uh, want to come visit, you can have a, a tour with Elise, obviously, and or you could do it by yourself. But really it's off the beaten track but we think it's a lovely place off the beaten track and we'll talk more about henry the fourth right about architecture and the renaissance and the wars of religion right because we you know other podcasts we were trying to decide elise had notes about all of these wonderful things to talk about and i thought well let's just concentrate on one aspect and on another podcast we'll do Henry IV and the Wars of Religion, because he was it's really, really important. right in the middle right of that. Middle of and also Renaissance architecture. Be because he's responsible for many things you have or will see in Paris and don't know that. That's right. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll get back to Henry IV. We just wanted to touch on this one aspect of his life in the Southwest as a... As a Southwest kid myself, and, I, and just I one, like one last thing that has to do with Toulouse and Henry the Fourth. We have the privilege of having in Toulouse 
the only statue that he ever posed for while he was alive, hmm. that is uh, a, a statue that you can see when you go to the Capitol Square in Toulouse, because Toulouse was one of his favorite cities. Of course it is. Of course. All right, Elise, thank you very much. You are welcome, Annie. And we will talk to you next week. See you. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thank you, Linda Pearson, Jennifer Miller, and Dawn Davis for pledging to support the show on Patreon this week. And my thanks also to all the other patrons who support the show month after month. Thank you for giving back. To support the show on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash join us. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Join us without any slashes or dashes or anything like that. And you guys rock. Thank you. For my personal update this week, I have been hanging out with an 11-month-old black Labrador puppy all weekend. He's in training to become a guide dog for the blind, but I'm not training him. I'm just uh, a, a host family, I guess you call it. Famille Rollet is what we call it in French. Uh, his regular family went away for the Easter weekend and I volunteered to take care of him, which I do regularly these days. He has been a delight. He's really well behaved. He loves our walks <laughs> and he jumps in all the puddles with gusto and, and he doesn't complain when I rub him down and force him to stay on the mat inside, you know, in the, by the front door while he dries off, uh, it's amazing how much joy I get out of simple walks in the countryside with a dog. I love walking no matter what, and I do it with or without a dog, but with a dog, it's so much better. And because I'm recording this on Easter Monday, which is a holiday in France, we saw a lot of relaxed, happy families looking for chocolate eggs in their gardens and lots of people walking their own dogs. And we got lucky because it's overcast, but it's the weather is nice, not windy. It's lovely. And I have to tell you a little secret about France. So shh, don't repeat it, okay? I often read that French people get fresh bread for breakfast every morning. Don't hate me for popping your bubble, but... Everybody I know in France eats bread from the day before at breakfast. I know the horrors. Well, most mornings, unless it's a weekend or a day off like today, the bakery was packed today in my village, we don't have the time to get fresh bread from the bakery. And the only time you'll see me at the bakery at 7 a.m. is when I ran out of bread and there's no bread in my freezer either. So yeah, in the morning, I and most of France, we eat bread from the day before that we toast or even bread that we keep in the freezer. What? French people eat frozen bread too? Oh yes, we do. <laughs> Sometimes I buy too much bread one day, like probably today, I think I bought too much. So I slice it up and I put it in the freezer. Then someday when I miscalculate again, but in the other direction, I got too little bread. All I have to do is go get a bag of sliced frozen bread from my freezer, pop it in the toaster, and we're good to go for breakfast. When you come to France, you can see this for yourself. The time of day when there are lines in front of the boulangerie is around noon, but even more so around 6 or 7 p.m. when people come home from work. 7 a.m. on a weekday, no lines. <laughs> so... No, we don't get fresh bread from a bakery every day in France. We get it later in the day. And uh, on weekends, obviously, bakeries are very busy. And on, on holiday weekends, even more. I have a favor to ask of you. Because the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook is so active and people are so engaged... Facebook automatically suggests the group to people who are interested in France, but they know nothing about the podcast. 
So a lot of people join the group and don't know that it's a podcast. I'd love your help in telling them about the podcast. Maybe suggest an episode that was particularly helpful to you. It's getting easier and easier to listen to the podcast. We're on Alexa, on Spotify, Google Play Music, Apple Podcasts, and more. Obviously, you who are listening right now, you've figured out how to listen to podcasts for yourself, but maybe you could suggest one of those ways to somebody else. And thank you for helping me spread the good word. And of course, it's all free, so why not? The rail strike is about to get underway tomorrow. Listen to episode 189 for strategies of how to get around France without using the train. The strike is going to be big and other public service sector uh, transportation companies are likely to join. Air France has already joined the strike for several days. Um, the RATP, so that's the, uh, that's the metro system in Paris, uh, is likely to join at some point as well. So if you're coming to France this spring, I highly recommend you think about alternative modes of transportation. At least learn about them so you're prepared. To learn about Uber in Paris, listen to episode 151. To learn about the bus in Paris, listen to episode 142. And about the regional buses in France, that was episode 75. The number of reservations on regional buses has tripled as a result of this rail strike. And companies like Flixbus and Easy Lines, that's spelled with I's, are responding to the demand by adding more buses. So you also have uh, ride-sharing sites such as Blah Blah Car. There are solutions. You just need to get informed and uh, make plans. People love the email extras, especially the printables I send out to supplement what you hear on the episodes. It's typically a one-page PDF that gives you the bullet points of what we discussed, so you can print them out and take them with you when you come to France. To request to get the email extras, go to joinusinfrance.com and um, there will be a pop-up or you can just, um, on the side, there's a little green button. And if you don't want to get the extras, please unsubscribe because I really don't want to be emailing people who don't want this stuff. So uh, I don't feel bad when people unsubscribe. If they don't want it, I don't want to mm -hmm. send it to them. On the show next week, it will be an episode with Claire Armstrong about moving to France. She makes it sound really easy and she explains all the steps she had to take and how it worked. I don't know if it was that she was super prepared or if things just got easier with time, but she makes it sound totally doable, you'll see. The best way to connect with me is via email, annie at joinusinfrance.com, or if you have a question you'd like answered on the show, leave a message on 1-801-806-1015. You can also join the awesome Join Us in France closed group on Facebook, where lots of knowledgeable folks hang out and exchange France trip advice without any strings attached. Au revoir, have a great week of trip planning. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2017 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.